Revelation is one of the most studied books in the Bible. Revelation is one of the least studied books in the Bible. A lot of people are so afraid of it that they won't read it. They start seeing a dragon and they start seeing all these beasts and they start seeing seas that are turned to blood and all this language and it just scares them. They have no idea what it is and so the easiest thing to do is what? Just avoid it. Other people on the other hand, stud their entire theology is built what's in the book of Revelation. And so it kind of gives a totally different twist to the way that they study. A lot of people have written books, hundreds if not thousands of books on the book of Revelation. There are numerous different views depending on who you listen to. There are 57 different dates that have been set for the return of Jesus. And so I don't know why people are confused about the book of Revelation. But everyone has a different view or a little bit different twist. But we want to get past all of that. And we want to spend our time looking at the book, seeing if indeed Revelation doesn't explain itself. Just like Jesus' parables, he would tell a parable and then what would he do? He'd explain what it means. And well, that's what we're going to find in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, we find the consummation of God's revelation to man. Just think about, we're going to go all the way from Genesis to Revelation and see how God laid out his plan for the redemption of man. In Genesis, it says that God gave us or there is creation of heaven and earth. In Revelation, there's a new heaven and earth. In Genesis, God gives man an earthly paradise. In Revelation, he gives us a heavenly paradise. In Genesis, Satan's appearance and sin begins. In Revelation, Satan is banned and wiped out. In Genesis, Paradise is lost. In Revelation, paradise is regained. In Genesis, we have the rise of Babylon. In Revelation, we have the doom of Babylon. Genesis, man is estranged from God because of his sin. And in Revelation, man is reunited. So we have the entire consummation of everything that God had in plan for man. I found this and I just couldn't help but use it. It said, hey Satan, we read the back of the book and guess what? We win, you lose. That's really what we're going to be talking about as we go through this 15 uh, week study. And what I'd like to see you unveiling, and we're just going to introduce some of these things this morning and we're going to talk about how they kind of fit together and try to remove some of the confusion. If we can just take a look at what the book says about itself and how it defines itself, we'll have a lot better understanding. If you really want to know what the book is about, it's set up in a pattern of behavior, uh, Saturn, uh, a group of sevens. Revelation is made up of four, matter of fact, series of sevens with various parenthetical sections interspersed. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And if you've read Revelation lately, you know that we have the first six units, which are the seven seals in chapter six. We have the seven trumpets in chapters eight, two through nine, verse 21. We have seven bowls, and we're gonna go into detail about each one of those in chapter 15, verse one, through chapter 16 and verse 12. And you'll find right in the middle of that, It'll go through and it'll talk about the seven seals and then there's a chapter that just kind of departs from that or a parenthesis. And then in, he'll come back with this, the uh, seventh seal. Same thing with the seven trumpets. We have six trumpets, a parenthesis in the middle, and then he'll open up the seventh seal. And we also have the th same thing with the bowls. Chapter eight, verse one. And then it goes through chapter 11, verse 15 through 18. And then the seventh bowl is in. So we have a group of sevens, and you're going to find seven throughout the book of Revelation. It's called biblical numerology, and it was very much a part of language in the first century. We have signs all the time. We don't just see, uh, say things to one another. We have signs. I was going to have one of my granddaughters who 
uh, no sign language to sign out for you. Uh, I have the best grandfather in the world, but uh, that didn't work out for some whatever reason. Uh, but she used signs, and people communicate with those signs. And we get on the road, and we are directed, we are controlled somewhat by the signs, are we not? Okay, so Revelation is built on these sevens throughout the book. We want to get in, first of all, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to introduce it, because we can chase rabbits for, from here on uh, in this. There are four common views of Revelation. It's a preterist view. This school of thought views Revelation as a book of history, not a prophecy about the end times. They believe that the book was totally fulfilled in John's day. The historic historist view. Revelation gives a brief eyes view of the entire sweep of Christian history. From the post-Pentecostal church in Acts chapter 2 until Jesus returns. Revelation then would have been little relevance to the original people to whom it was written. The third view is called the futurist view. This view interprets Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 through chapter 3 verse 22 as being written to churches of that day, but from chapters 4 through 19, they deal with a seven-year period called the Tribulation, which they say precedes the visual return of Jesus to the earth. And then there's a philosophy of history view, which is kind of where I land. The book was written with the conflict of the early church in mind, and yet it is written so that it applies just as much to the church today. The conflict between Satan and Pentecost until Jesus returns. There are seven keys to unlocking the view. You might want to write these down. I think they'll help you. The first key, Revelation is written in symbols. The word apocalypse, from which we get Revelation, apocalypse means an unveiling. How many of you have ever been to a play? You're sitting there in the audience and maybe there's an orchestra and you're waiting for the curtain to open. You don't know really what the play is about, and all of a sudden, the curtain opens. And you see all kinds of things on the stage. That's what the book of Revelation is. John deals with some very basic things, basically what Jesus is telling him to say in the first few chapters, in chapters 1 through uh, chapter 1. Then he talks about the church, seven churches to whom this is to be addressed, but at chapter 4, just think of it as the curtain begins to draw back. And God is going to give John, who in, then, who in turn is going to give to us, the revelation of what's taking place before the time of the church, during the time of the church, and until Christ returns again. In the book, we're going to see a seven-headed dragon. We're going to see a seven-headed beast with ten horns. We're going to see a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. We're going to uh, see seas turning to blood, horses with fire and smoke coming out of their mouths, a woman who stands on the moon, a city in the shape of a, a city in the shape of a cube, 1,500 miles tall, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles wide. Big apartment building. Symbols are used as a language to help us understand our past. Symbols communicate different things to different people at different times depending on what their culture <clears throat> and is going on at that, that time. So the first thing that we've got to do is to realize that Revelation is written in symbols for the most part. The <clears throat> what we need to do is to always read the Word of God and assume that it's quite literal unless we're told otherwise. For example, Jesus told a story about a splinter in your eye and a log in the eye. How many of you think that was literally what he was going to say? Now, we understand that that's a symbol. He was trying to symbolize what he was trying to teach. And that's the same way here. We read the book of Revelation as literal unless it tells us otherwise. And when he says, I want you to symbolize this in Revelation 1 verse 3, he said, these things are signified is really what the Greek word means. In other words, I'm giving you a lesson in signs, and then it'll tell us when it's being literal. 
The second key, these events are whatever we're going to be writing about or reading about, are to shortly come to pass. In Revelation 1 and verse 3, the time is at hand. In Revelation 3 verse 11, I come quickly. In Revelation 22 and verse 6, things much must shortly come to pass. Revelation 22, 7, I come quickly. Revelation 22 and verse 10, seal not the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. 22 verse 12, I come quickly. 22 verse 20, I come quickly. What message do you suppose John, the Holy Spirit through John is trying to communicate? Well, I think things are going to come quickly. And the third key, Revelation is given to comfort Christians. He said, I am, present tense, a partaker with you in the tribulation. He wanted to identify. He wanted to know that he knew. Where was John when he wrote this? The Isle of Patmos. He was in exile. In chapters 2 and 3, in five of the seven letters to the churches, John mentions persecution. In chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, he said, he talks about the souls of those beheaded for their testimony about Jesus. In chapter 12, verse 17, in chapter 20, in verse 4, why, or when are you going to avenge our blood? Chapter 7, and verse 14, a great host will come out of the great tribulation. Chapter 13, verse 15, and 17, 6, the harlot spill the blood of the saints. What's the common theme here? Persecution. We're going to be talking about throughout the book about persecution of God's church and his people. The fourth key, we've got to identify who the main characters are. We have a dragon showing up. We have a beast that comes up out of the sea. We have a, another beast that comes out of the land. We have two women that are prominent characters. One of them is a harlot. The other is a woman that is pregnant. And we want to get into, as we go through the book, what each of these means and what they symbolize. The dragon. In Revelation 12, verses 3 through 8, it says that he sweeps a third of the stars of the sky. He persecutes a woman of a child, and he brings up two beasts to be his helpers in persecuting God's people. All right, we're going to identify loosely right now, generally, a dragon. Who is he? Well, the book of Revelation tells us very plainly. Revelation 12, verse 9 states plainly that the dragon is the old serpent who is called the devil and Satan. You can also go down to Revelation 20 and verse uh, 2, same thing. He sees the dragon, the ancient servant, who is the devil or the Satan. So we want to identify the first major characters that symbolize here. And John states very plainly that this dragon is whom? All right, as we're reading through this in the weeks ahead, here's what you want to always do. Realize we're talking symbolic language, and we'll show that that is identified throughout the book. And the first, every time you read about the devil, or every time you read about the dragon, think the devil. Okay? And then we've got the dragon in, in Revelation 13, verses 1 through 3, or 1 and 2. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns on its horns, and on each head had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. Why would anyone be afraid of this book? <laughs> what in the world have we got here? We've got monsters coming out of the sea, monsters coming out of the land. We've got a dragon that's chasing after a woman that's pregnant. Well, if we'll just take the time to really read and study and compare the verses, Revelation does a real good job of defining itself. So we want to identify who these two beasts are. First of all, he says, we have a beast that comes out of the sea. What does he look like? What is this beast represented as? The last verse in chapter 12 tells us that the dragon is making war against the woman 
and her offspring, those that hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. In chapter 13 and verse 7, it says that the beast was given power to wage war against the saints. The description of the beast reminds us of the prophecy of Daniel in Daniel 7. If you go back there and kind of, I'd like to challenge you before next week, go back and read Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Remember we had Nebuchadnezzar's dream? I know you remember that. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, <coughs> and Daniel interpreted that. He had a statue, remember his head, silver, and so forth. And it was destroyed later on. Daniel identifies that statue. He fulfills the interpretation of that statue. And what does he say the head of gold represented? Who's he talking to? Nebuchadnezzar, the king. So he's identifying empires. And then in Daniel chapter 7, we find the same creature or very similar creature identified here. You remember gold for Babylon? Then we had Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the church came, which was going to destroy all of those. Daniel 2.44, in the times of those kings, talking about all of these, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it let be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and will bring them to an end, but it will itself endure. So he identifies what the dream is and what they represent. Also in Daniel chapter 7, we find a creature there. What are his characteristics? Well, we have a lion, we have a bear, we have the leopard, and we have a creature. I don't really know what to call him. <laughs> but all these characteristics are also in the sea beast that comes up out of the sea. So there must be some, you know, John was familiar with this language. He was familiar with these representations. But who is the land beast? Well, he's the false prophet of emperor worship. Chapter 13, he appears with the sea beast. And in chapter 19, is destroyed with the sea beast. The second beast exercises authority under the oversight of the first beast. Both beasts speak like the dragon. So whoever these beasts are, they do what? They talk just like Satan, talk just like the devil. The second beast has one mission, to set up images of emperors and force people to worship them. And what we're going to find as we get into this is that Satan is working through the Roman Empire, more specifically through Rome, and through those that compromise the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this sets up a persecution starting with Domitian in about 80 AD. And what we're going to see is an unveiling and a growth of the persecution of Christianity. We'll go into that more as we get into the study. To do this, uses, he uses economic pressure and kills those who refuse to worship the first beast. A strong cult of emperor worship developed during the reign of Domitian, 81 through, 80, uh, 81 through 93. Huge, elaborate temples were built where the emperors were to be worshipped as gods. People were required to take a pinch of incense before they entered what we would call a shopping center or the area where commerce took place and say, Caesar is Lord and God. Can't get into that area except you go through an ark. You are required to do that, say that, before you enter the garden. You're a Christian. What's going to happen? Are you going to do that? Are people encouraged to do that? Yes. Tempted to do that. Because if you don't do that, there are bad things coming down the pike. By way of economy, withdrawing your livelihood, and even at times requiring your life. And Revelation, the third key is, is given to comfort persecuted Christians. Chapter 1, verse 9, I am, present tense, 
a partaker with you in the tribulation. He says that this is all about persecution from Satan who is using these other tools of these beasts in order to accomplish his purpose of destroying the testimony about Jesus. Satan doesn't like our Lord and will do anything and use anything or use anyone to destroy his influence. As we go through and identify each of these beasts, I think you're going to see a common theme uh, that's going to be coming up. So this false prophet, we just want to make sure that we identify him. It exercises authority of the beast, Revelation 13 and verse 12. It makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, so he's subservient to the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed in, in Revelation 13 and verse 12. He uses super weapons. We're told in Revelation 13, 13, he performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And then his purpose, to worship the image of the beast or die. And then that we're all familiar with Mark uh, 666. Just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. The reason they're talking about a mark on your head or a mark on your hand, whenever you went into the marketplace to conduct business, you had to have a mark on your hand, like a stamp when we used to go to the roller rink, you know, to show that you've been there. You have to have that mark. And so having the mark of Satan on your head is just an indication that you yielded to that pressure to worship the emperor. And so this, this is another bad guy. So we're going to identify them further in a little bit. The fifth key, who's the harlot introduced in Revelation chapter 17? Larry. Well, she's a great city that rules over kings of the earth. Look at verse 18. She commits fornication with kings. Verse 2. She rides or rules over the first beast. Verses 3 through 5. Now, this is all in Revelation 17. And she holds a cup filled with the blood of the saints, having drunk so much of their blood that she's intoxicated. And she holds the power of the first beast. Whatever she is, whoever we identify her with, she has the same purpose as the first beast and of the dragon. Okay, I'm trying to get a lot of information in to lay the foundation before we really get into chapter one next week. If we can identify who these individuals or characters are, we're going to go in with a better understanding of what John is going to say in chapters four through chapter 19. In the first century, Rome was known as Babylon. Babylon was a great city. Babylon was one of the seven wonders of the world. It represented tremendous evil. And it was common for Rome to be referred to as Babylon. We'll be introduced to that again later in the book. It was also very common for Rome itself, not the Roman Empire, we'll tell, deal with that separately, but Rome, the city of Rome, was known to be a beautiful city. I'll show you a copy of coins that have been unearthed that say Rome, the beautiful lady. And it has her dressed in all kinds of jewelry and fancy array. And so that would have been very common. Whenever you use that terminology, the people of the first century would have known immediately. Revelation identifies Babylon as the city of Rome. First century Christians have a vivid understanding of, of uh, Rome. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we're introduced to another lady. And she has an interaction, an ongoing interaction with the dragon. In Revelation chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2, a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Revelation chapter 12 contains a description of a woman who's clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, crown on her head, 12 stars in her hand. The woman's about to give birth and guess who's standing there with the sole purpose of taking the child and destroying it? Who might that be? 
as we go through this, we're going to see it clearly identified as uh, the one who's trying to uh, destroy her, obviously, is the devil. Who is the battle, who is the persecution really from? Satan and his beast. And so he's setting up a, a picture for us of something that has 12 stars, what do they represent? Well, what seems to make most sense, and it does not clearly identified in the book, is that this is Israel. 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 stars. And she is giving birth. Who would that be? Who would that child be that Satan is so concerned about that he wants to be there when the child is delivered that he might destroy the child? Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's talking from beginning to end about this persecution, this tribulation, this uh, focus that Satan has on destroying, first of all, Jesus and all those who follow him. Revelation identifies the 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, or times, times and a half time. Have you ever read those? Say, what in the world? These times are mentioned five times in the book of Revelation, all in chapters 11, 12, and 13. Twice it is called 1260 days. Twice it's called 42 months. And once three and a half years, or in some translation, time, times, and a half time. All of these suggest a period of the same length. 1260 days divided by 30 is 42 months. 42 months divided by 12 would be three and a half years. So we're talking about the same period of time uh, in all of these. In Revelation 11 verse 2 it says, Gentiles are to tread over this holy city for 42 months. In chapter 11 verse 3 and in verse 7, the two witnesses, God's people, are said to testify for 1260 days while under attack and at the end of which they are killed in the holy city. So time and time and time again, we find that this is a period of persecution, it's a period of time of tribulation that John introduces right from the beginning. All of these are re referenced to the same thing. 30 days was the Roman calendar. There wasn't 31 or 28, there were 30 days. And so we're talking about the, exactly the same period of time. The beast will make war with the saints, it says in chapter 13, verse 7, for 42 months. 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, time, time, and a half time, all refer to this period of time that God's children are going to be persecuted. And I realize I'm going a lot faster than I usually do, but there's a lot to get in before we really get into the study that I hope uh, will uh, be helpful. What happens during this time? Well, whether spoken of days, months, or years, the activity mentioned is always an attack on God's saints. In two events, Satan, the dragon, is said to be the attacker. In three of the events, the sea beast, the Roman Empire, is said to be the attacker. The Roman Empire launched a crusade of persecution that lasted from 90 A.D., the book is written about 95 A.D., to around 300 A.D. And we've all heard the stories about what happened to Christians during that period of time. They were put in their arena, they were fed to you know, wild uh, lions, all kinds of hideous stuff was done trying to stomp out this movement called Christianity. Since the two beasts and the dragon and the harlot are all understood as symbols, we must also understand these times to be symbols as well. Again, there was something that was very part of the common language of the first century, and that was that they used biblical numerology, they used symbols, as we've already seen as far back as Daniel, using the statue, interpretation of the statue and the beast that he saw in his uh, time. All right, the seventh key. Revelation identifies the kingdom. We get into a little bit of controversy here, a lot of different interpretations and understanding, but I'm going to give you mine. 
Uh, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, John says, Christ made us, past tense, Christ made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God. He's saying that in past tense. God made us to be a kingdom, past tense. Priest to serve his God, past tense. So John and those to whom he's writing are already in the kingdom and are present tense priest. Thus, it is a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus, as we'll find out as we close out today, is going to say when he's before Pilate. Again, in verse Chapter 1, verse 9, John says that he is a companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance, present tense. He says that's happening now. I am a participator. I am participating in the persecution or the trial or the struggle that you're going through and that you will go through. He says, I am in the kingdom with you now. And so, as we go through this, and we're going to deal with this a little bit more, but I want to I close with just another verse. When Jesus was challenged, he said, what's your kingdom? What was he being accused by the Jews of? He was trying to usurp authority. He was trying to take the place of Caesar. They were trying to make him look like a uh, rebel against the Roman Empire. And he, bring, uh, he brings him in, Pilate brings him in, and he begins to question him. This is found in John chapter 18, the same John that's writing Revelation. John 18, verses 33 through 36. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you, what? King of the Jews? Jesus' response, is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? I am a Jew, Pilate said. Your own people and chief priests have handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, now this tells you what the accusation was. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom, present tense, is from another place. So let's just kind of summarize and wrap this up. What do we have? As we introduce the book, we have in chapter 1, he's going to introduce where the book came from. And if you just want to put something in the margin of your Bible, it's good. The Father, the Son, the Angel, who gave it to John. John is to sit down and write, who? Seven churches. And there are fascinating stories about the background of each of those churches. As we go through and Jesus says, I know your works. Now, what he's saying, Ephesus, I know your works. Pergamum, I know your works. Thyatira, I know your works. And if he's standing in any church today, he could say, I know your works. Jesus knows what's going on in this assembly. That's one of the lessons that he wants us to teach, uh, learn. And he knows specifically what we're doing that's good, what we're doing that's right. And he's going to mention to these seven churches. Again, interesting that it's the number seven again, which we'll see over and over again. And he says, in five of the churches, two of them were pleasing to him, five had a challenge. He said, I want you to take a look at what you're doing wrong. Each of them had a different thing. Some were compromising with Rome, with evil. Uh, some were lacking in love. He, he specifically speaks to the problems of each church. But not only that, he says, if there are some among you that will hear my words, he said, I'll reward you. Or if you don't hear my words, then here's going to be the result of that. Whether it's the taking away of the holy manna, whether it's the 
paradise or whether it's the tree of life, he said, I'm going to take it away. So he's not only dealing with individual churches, he's going to mention specific individual members of those churches in those seven letters. So let's take this home if we don't take anything else. Jesus knows what's going on in your life. Jesus knows what challenges you are going through. He knows how you are handling those challenges, good or bad. And if there are things that we're doing that are wrong, he says you need to repent. You need to change your mind about this, and you need to live a different way. So, we have a lot of beast. We're going to be talking about the land beasts and the sea beasts, specifically what they do and what their interaction is with a woman that is with child. We're going to be talking about Satan as he's directing the activities of these two beasts. Their only function is to help Satan do what he wants them to do. So that'll help us as we go through this. Revelation will identify specifically for us what each of these are doing and He's going to then at the end of it wrap it all up by saying, Satan, all the activity you're involved in against my saints and those who hold of the testimony of Jesus, you're going to be defeated. Nothing he can do can destroy you, folks. Satan will lose. Ultimately, we will win. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that he lived, for his birth. And Father, we thank you that he died on that cross that we might have eternal life. And while we're here, Father, living that, what we call the Christian life, help us, Father, to be totally committed to you. And forgive us for those times that we're not. Father, help us to glorify him through everything that we do, say, and think. And we ask, Father, that you be with us as we go through this study of Revelation. Help us to understand, Father, this battle that we have going with Satan. And help give us the comfort and the hope that we have because we know through this book that you will deliver us. We will be victorious. In the name of Jesus, our King and our Lord, amen.